Okay, this uh, talk is about the relationship between land and tenure. Tenure being uh, how people own or hold land. And we're going to focus in particularly on the processes around which people gain access to land and hold on to it, because I think that's essential to thinking about pastoral systems. And we're going to be thinking through that about the type of institutions um, the sort of rules, regulations, rules of the game more broadly uh, that affect how that happens in pastoral settings. So the debate about land tenure is a long and contentious one. Um, and I want to highlight two sides of a debate that has been running since at least the publication of Garrett Hardin's Tragedy of the Commons in Science in 1968. Um, obviously these debates preceded that but the publication of that article which made the case that uh, without the regulation of, of access to land the automatic result would be a tragedy of the commons who'd get because it would be effectively what he was talking about is an open access arrangement and people would put more and more stock on the land and environmental degradation would ensue. Now this narrative of the tragedy of the commons has become you know, central to ways people discuss land and tenure and degradation and so on. We discussed elements of this in the discussion earlier about, in an earlier talk, about um, desertification. But of course many of these settings that he was talking about fisheries inland fisheries grazing systems and so on weren't actually really open access which was just a free-for-all they were actually governed in some way as commons so in fact it was a misnomer his article it wasn't a tragedy of the commons it was a tragedy of open access um, and this was the big point that uh, Eleanor Ostrom pointed out in uh, the work that led ultimately to her gaining a Nobel Prize in economics, the first woman to do so. Um, and the uh, most important book, and there are many, many publications, was Governing the Col Commons, and the debate about the evolution of collective action and the institutions for collective action to manage common property resources. There was a huge body of work through the 80s into the 90s, particularly after the publication of that book in 1990, that aimed to demonstrate what was called common property resource management. And a lot of that work was centred on rangelands because these were seen to be the classic cases of common property. And the Bloomington archive that uh, Ellen Ostrom and others um, convened and the emergence of the International Association for the Study of Common Property Resources became the intellectual and practical focus and policy-based focus for a lot of this debate. But we ended up, as we often do in these situations, with a, with a binary, is it either the tragedy of the commons or is it... Um, uh, common property resource management and I'm going to argue a bit later that it's uh, that in many situations it's uh, it's a bit of both but anyway let's go to uh, Ostrom's principles I'm not going to go through these these are very well known and have become as it were the hallmark of the debate about common property but we have to ask, do in the situations where we work, this full set, which is quite requiring, um, uh, do they all apply? Because these are the conditions that she says from her positioning as a sort of institutional econo economist that need to apply for effective common property resource management to, to operate. And if you, you know, run through the words in that list, uh, this involves having defined boundaries, defined groups, hierarchical rulemaking, and so on. Quite a strict set um, that don't always apply. Way back in uh, 1999, I think, um, we did a uh, IDS working paper on institutions and uncertainty uh, that was led by Lila Mehta, 
because we at that time had some concerns with the way that this rather sort of homogenizing view from institutional economics was being uh, discussed and actually there were many other questions about how institutions particularly in the context of uncertainty um, play out uh, around the management of resources so Ostrom's input was massively important I don't want to undermine it um, uh, massively important in pushing us away from this simplistic narrative of, of the tragedy of the commons. But maybe it was, in a way, because of its, its sort of unity and simplicity, uh, a bit too simplistic. And I'll come back to that, because it doesn't always apply. So, the process of enclosure, the process by which people gain exclusive access to resources is uh, has a long history on the rangelands and we've discussed this a number of times in these talks this is a picture of of the rangelands in in sardinia uh, following uh, late 19th century imposition of uh, the privatization of rangelands you can see them um, fenced off or divided up by hedges very familiar landscape across Europe, much of, of, of the UK rangelands look like that. But of course the enclosures in England uh, go back much earlier to, to the period of the Enclosure Acts between 1750 and 1850 and subsequent efforts since then, whereby, as it were, the abolishment of the open field system resulted in the ability of feudal landlords to acquire property um, individually and the argument was familiar argument still used today that by privatizing land it would increase its productivity and that those who could no longer use that land would go off and fuel the industrial revolution in england so that whole story of enclosure in europe in particular is one that resonates today elsewhere and it's become one of those central narratives in policy uh, that affects people's thinking that uh, inevitably through an evolutionary process uh, there is a point where land must be privatized if it is to become valuable um, again uh, referring to Karl Marx he talked about land grabbing uh, probably one of the earliest mentions of the, even the term land grabbing. He said land grabbing on a great scale is the first step in creating a field for the establishment of agriculture on a great scale. Hence this subversion of agriculture puts on at first more the appearance of a political revolution. So his argument was that again a sort of deterministic view of history that actually um, the uh, the movement from a peasantry to an industrial form of agriculture and the creation of industrial capitalism was an inevitable part of the process of change. But in the settings that we work in, in pastoral settings, in dryland settings, it's worth asking whether these broad schemas really work. When does it pay to fence? It really doesn't make sense in many settings if it's a very broad, open, dry rangeland to put fences up because fences cost. That's an institutional economics argument. The transaction cost of fencing may exceed the value of that enclosure. And in fact, what we see is often people enclosing relatively small areas of land for fodder production, for bits of agriculture and so on. So we see a much more variegated pattern of enclosure than a mass enclosure movement. But in the end, it's not just about transactional economics and institutional economics. It's about basically political economy. When do the powerful in society, as with the feudal landlords and the state in England in the 1750s to 1850s, um, see it appropriate to enclose land in order to shift the political dynamic in the countryside? And a lot of that is what we're seeing at the moment in pastoral areas in the context of massive investment. Now, we have a separate uh, talk on land, land grabbing and so on. So I'm not going to go into this in great detail now. More to point to questions about how does land 
in the context of new investments or in con context of enclosures get controlled by others? And I think that's an important question to ask in pastoral settings. These are pictures from uh, the Tibetan uh, study area where in the past decade, literally in the past decade mostly, um, urbanization, in, uh, putting up uh, windmills and so on, building roads, has happened on what were formerly mostly uh, pastoral rangelands. So what's the process of what uh, some people call land control, the process of gaining access? I don't want to talk about the broader picture of, of land investment uh, now and defer that to the other talk by Jeremy Lind. So I want to point to three ways of thinking about that process from the literature. The first is, is thinking about access. Access, the means, relations, processes used to derive benefits from resources. Access seen as a bundle of powers. This is from a paper from a while ago by Jesse Rebo and Nancy Peluso called The Theory of Access. So this is distinct from property rights to resources. This is a process uh, of gaining access through a bundle of powers. And I think that's a useful way of thinking about it processually rather than just thinking about it as rights to property. This is extended, I think, nicely. And again, Nancy Peluso was, was also involved in, in this special issue on um, uh, land control together with Christian Lund uh, in the Journal of Peasant Studies about 2011. And what they talk about is, is this term land control. This was slightly a reaction to the big debates in land grabbing at that time, which was very focusing on the event of the grab rather than the processes by which grabbing or acquisition or um, enclosure happen. And again, quoting from their introductory article, uh, by land control we mean practices that fix or consolidate forms of access, so very similar to the Rebo and Peluso article, not surprising because Nancy was involved in both. Forms of access claiming an exclusion for some period of time, enclosure, territorialization and legalization processes, as well as force and violence or the threat of them, all serve to control land. So a number of different processes at play. The mechanisms of land control need not always align, nor proceed in a singular linear direction. Uh, at one level obvious, but uh, at another level I think important because it suggests some empirical questions about how land is controlled by different actors through different processes. And that's what uh, Christian Lund and Thomas Sickle call the politics of possession because it's fundamentally a political process. There's another very nice book um, that I can recommend in thinking about these things based on work in Southeast Asia called The Powers of Exclusion by Derek Hall, Phil Hirsch and Tanya Lee where they look at the interaction of four processes regulation, force, the market and legitimation as the way that exclusions happen. So regulation is often about state and legal instruments, but not exclusively. Force is essentially violence or the threat thereof um, being brought to bear by both state and non-state actors. The market obviously is, acts as a power of exclusion through prices and through incentives that encourage more individualized claims. And legitimation is the moral basis, the discourses around which um, exclusions are entrenched. And that book, I think, very nicely illustrates that for Southeast Asia. But reading it, you will see that it could apply uh, in many pastoral areas uh, across the world. So these processes of exclusion, processes of enclosure, the processes of gaining access to land uh, that once was uh, common uh, and making it more privatized is a phenomenon we see uh, generally, and it's a phenomenon in the drylands uh, just as much as elsewhere. And private tenure for many people, fencing and exclusion of others and the creation of, of fenced paddocks or fenced ranches is seen as, as it were, the natural progression from uh, common 
flexible mobile pastoral systems. So you see lots and lots of um, reports out there often drawing on the likes of Hernando de Soto who's been this sort of um, disciple of privatization if you like coming out of work from Peru in urban Peru um, who says that you know unless it's unless land is is owned and privatized it's dead capital it can't be used which I think is just a nonsense argument but it's a very powerful argument and has been bought by many who see privatization as more an ideological move than a one about uh, e simply economics because if you actually go back to the detailed economics there have been loads of studies over many many years and I won't go through all of them they're in the reading list associated with this talk from Klaus Deininger, from Feder, Feder and Neurone, from Migot Adola, Hazel, many many others often associated with World Bank interestingly enough who haven't been in the debate about land the what one might expect of the World Bank this sort of ideological push for privatization because the data just doesn't show it they can many of those studies compared what are the returns from common property or communal uh, collective arrangements and private and it just doesn't bear up to the um, ideological position of uh, De Soto and others that private ta private tenure is necessarily the best and automatic solution because of course when we look empirically even if you see fences stretching across the landscape like this and this is again in uh, in Tibet they're not necessarily private in the sense that this is exclusive individual ownership there's often much more hybrid arrangements between along the spectrum from collective to fully private and indeed within so-called private tenure there are lots of variations so they can be legislated between freehold leasehold permit arrangements with different forms of authority given to people uh, as the owner or there can be so-called vernacular forms of tenure that give some private rights but within a more collective arrangement so the simple notion of private tenure is not so simple when you look at it in detail and when you do look at it in detail the argument that private tenure always is the best solution for investment uh, and bringing um, increases in productivity that doesn't stand up either so these are the big debates that have been happening over the last 20 odd years um, between private communal and various other versions and the question of what's the process of people gaining access but I think for um, thinking about um, systems in pastoral areas we have to be a little bit more sophisticated because these classic uh, debates again as ever have been played out largely in ag agrarian settings or indeed in urban settings where the distinctions between private and communal may be a, a little bit more um, obvious these again some pictures from uh, Tibetan landscapes and it's in these settings that uh, pastures country lead for China Gongbu has done some fantastic work I think um, and a really really good paper in ecology and society recently with others on Tibetan pastoral systems and questions of tenure and what I, he argues and it's not an, an argument that's new to pastoral studies but I think it's very well done here is that pastoralists accommodated different rangeland reforms imposed by the Chinese state that attempted to privatize through a variety of hybridized arrangements and that actually when pastoralists negotiated those arrangements for some level of collectivity within an overall framework that pushed privatized rangeland that it was those that allowed higher productivity and this was not surprisingly because this allowed more flexibility the more flexible use of rangelands and so on and so forth so although you see fences, and in both those pictures there are, 
This isn't classic private rangeland, or even collectively privatised rangeland. This is much more flexible than it looks. So this relates to the, a much wider debate in, in discussions of land and tenure around fuzzy boundaries, overlapping institutions, hybrid arrangements around property, all of which challenge the simplistic notion of privatisation, but they also, interestingly, challenge Ostrom's eight principles, because the the neat and simpli neat simplicity of those principles in empirical terms doesn't necessarily always apply. And there's, I think, been some really interesting work done on rangelands in the last few years by uh, Mark Moritz and colleagues, where they've argued through comparative work um, on rangelands initially in West Africa, but then globally and in relation to other common property or notionally common property systems. They've encountered this dilemma that many of us have felt, but have thought about it more deeply, that actually in many of these settings, in pastoral settings, there is effectively a condition of, op of, of open access, yet the tragedy of the commons that Hardin predicted doesn't happen. So these aren't carefully managed common property resource systems, a la Ostrom, but nor does the outcome that Hardin predicts from his economic model happen. So what's going on? So what they argue, and I think it's, it's in several papers, one in human ecology, and very recently, in a month or two ago, uh, in 2019, I think, uh, in Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences, they argue that what we're seeing here are what they call open property systems, some kind of hybrid arrangement between uh, open access and common property. So it's not a bounded pro common property system or a free for all. So just to quote from Mark Moritz's uh, human ecology paper uh, on West Africa, pastoral mobility across patches in an open system is supported by Cross-boundary networks, one, autonomous decision-making, two, and linked information and sharing coordination amongst actors. So those are the features that he identifies from this comparative study um, that create this open property system. Neither common property, a la Ostrom, or a free-for-all, a la Hardin. So, actually, this is in essence what we know pastoralism to be about coordinated, networked, decision-making, um, cross-boundary networks, uh, and so on. So in a way, what they're arguing for is that pastoral mobility, as a practice, is really central to sustaining uh, these open property systems. It's worth reading the papers to get the detail, and in the PNAS paper, the recent one, um, uh, they develop uh, this in a model, a, a sort of socio-ecological model, which I think is quite interesting. But they're also making the case that this works particularly in low-value systems, i.e. The, the value of the resource, isn't, it isn't worth privatising it, so rangelands, for example, and non-equilibrium systems where mobility is, is essential. So as a... Uh, as a sort of new way of thinking about this debate, I think it's actually very useful and particularly useful for, for pastoral systems because it's emerged out of those contexts. Key implication of it, which I think is also important for us when thinking about resources as land and tenure, is actually not to focus on the resource itself, the field or the pasture that's enclosed, but the actors and practices, including mobility, that result in the emergence of these, uh, these sustainable uh, property systems. So that shifts our focus from the classic list of, of uh, Ostrom, which is all about bounding the resource and the people that are on it and how the rules are implemented, to, the, to how uh, networks of information and actors play out. And I think this is an important development which is worth us all thinking uh, more. It's, it's currently sort of tentative, and it's, but it's out there in the literature and waiting to be explored and tested. And I think Gong Bu, 
or well, not directly related to that, is ha has worked elements of that out already for the Tibetan setting. So, the relation between land and resources we just discussed, but what about the relationship between land and property, obviously the key notion around uh, tenure, and broader questions of citizenships and, and politics? Because I think that relation is also important in pastoral areas. How do people in relation to land construct themselves and other, how do other people construct themselves as citizens? So I want to mention, um, well, respond to a number of questions, five in all, very briefly in relation to some of the literature around that. Because I think some of this literature exposes and pushes us to think a little bit more laterally um, about these questions. And there's been some very good literature on this subject, drawing on not necessarily pastoral settings, but various other settings over the last uh, few years. First question is, what is land? It's kind of like, oh, why do you ask that question? And I'm referring here to a fantastic paper by Tanya Lee in the Transactions Geography Journal, where she says, basically makes the argument that, as it were, the resourceness of land has to be constructed. Now you think that's all, oh, that's a bit of a complicated argument, but read the paper in full because you'll get the picture better than I'll be able to explain it very briefly now. But she uses the concept of assemblage, which has been widely used, drawing from Saskia Sassen and many others, to argue that despite land often being referred to as a, com a commodity, to turn it to productive re re use requires various things to happen. Regimes of exclusion that distinguish between legitimate and illegitimate, illegitimate users and u uses and users. Well, we've discussed that before. The inscribing of boundaries of different sorts through devices such as fences, title deeds, laws, zones, regulations, landmarks, and storylines. And this is all reinforced what, by what she calls statistical picturing, which is essentially, you know, all those land use maps that you see in government offices um, that create the nature of what land is as a resource in different colours. So its resourceness, she argues, is not an intrinsic quality. It actually emerges from this assemblage of material things, relations, technologies and discourses that actually have to be pulled together to make this happen. And that requires work, work by different actors. So land can be very different. Um, the notion of land can be very different depending on who's doing that work. So what is land and how it's constructed is important, which relates to the second question, which is the relationship between land and social relations which is essentially what Sarah Berry and many others have said, but Sarah Berry perhaps most um, effectively, is that land tenure and land relations are all about how the sociality of relationships between resources and people. And again, investing in social relations is about investing in land. So creating the exclusions we've, we've talked about is all about um, or boundaries, soft boundaries of various sorts, is all about that. And that's how tenure emerges from those social relations. So we can't just look for the fences on a map. We have to understand what they mean um, in any particular setting. These three pictures are from our three core pastoral study sites in Tibet, Isiolo and uh, Sardinia, respectively. And you can see the landscape's quite different. But they're all constructed through this process of social relations. And all of those fences, all of those where those animals are, those houses are, um, are not necessarily uh, just natural. They're created by social processes and political processes. And this is the argument of legal anthropology, for example, Sally Fort Moore and others are arguing that this always these hybrid institutional forms emerge in plural legal systems and the type of places we work are always plural legal systems involving state legalities local uh, forms of, of legalities and institutions and so on the third question is about land class and gender 
that's actually the theme of the previous talk, so I won't um, reiterate all of that. But uh, Pauline Peters, in particular, has challenged to some, th to, uh, to some extent Sarah Berry, um, saying, well, it's not just about negotiations and social relations and all of this um, intimate anthropological stuff. I mean, they're both actually anthropologists, I think. Actually, no, Sarah's a historian. Um, it's actually also about class. Structural relations affect that, how that happens. So let's not forget uh, these wider structural features that affect how land and land relations are constructed. Fourth question is about the relationship between property and authority. A lot of these processes are about creating the notion of property. Property as, and this is to quote uh, Thomas Sickor and Christian Lund, prop property as a, uh, the proce process of seeking authorizations for property claims also has the effect of granting authority to the authorizing politico-legal institution. In other words, the state or the local leadership or the monastery or whoever we're talking about, their authority is created in tandem with the process of claiming um, and them giving authorization. So it's a social process and what they call the politics of possession. So again, rather than it just being imposed from outside, it's always a negotiated process. So I think that's an important one, the relationship between property and authority, because sometimes we think, oh, well, property, that's just the title deed. Well, no, it's actually much more than that. There's a lot more that goes into creating something that can be called property, mine, rather than yours. So struggles over natural resources, land, as in these pictures, are often about everyday state formation. So if we have to understand the state as who arbitrates over access to land, we have to understand those everyday practices that create authority. And that's the nature of what territorialization and state making is all about. Particularly in areas where the central state is distant, in all of these cases relatively distant, um, geographically and, um, and politically. Final question is about how all this relates to the construction of citizenship and indeed recognition and belonging. Having access to land is often very much about who people are. People in discourses from pastoralists or farmers or whoever, it's very much about who I am in relation to that land and then Access to that land very much constructs citizenship, and citizenship is constructed in relation to property, authority, and land access. And this is an argument made by Christian Lund and many others, that uh, struggles over citizenship and property are as much about the scope and constitution of authority as about access to, to membership and to resources. So it's about constitutions of authority. And constitutions of authority is about citizenship, the relationship between people in a society and sovereign authorities, whether that's the state or local leaderships or whatever. So it's not necessarily about national citizenship only, but it's also about, um, uh, about local forms of citizenship. So the nature of the politics of citizenship is very, very different, for example, and the nature of, private, uh, of state authority, for example, or other forms of authority, between individualized private tenure and more communal and commoning tenure. Just think about it. The relationships of access and collective arrangements make different citizens. Um, in, in the UK, the whole privatisation of council housing was the central core of Mrs Thatcher's policy of creating a new form of citizenship in Britain. The parallels are obvious. Okay, so those are, that's a big run through of vast literature. Um, so where does this all end up in thinking about policy? We thought about the debate between 
common property and open access. We thought about the debates about what private property means. We thought about debates about land control and how people gain access. And we thought here about issues of the relationship between property and land and resources and citizenship and, and state making. Quite a complex literature coming out of political science and anthropology and law and so on. Where does it end up in policy debates? Well, in rangelands and pastoral policy debates, there's been a lot of discussion in the last decade, certainly, about what so-called land governance and, and rangeland governance uh, means. And here are just some examples of millions of different articles and policy briefings and papers and conferences that have been on this very topic. Now it's a really important topic, no question. We've talked about the policy implications of the pressures of investment and enclosure and exclusion in rangelands. Um, and the process led by the FAO and in, unusually actually involving civil society to produce the so-called voluntary guidelines uh, to give them their full title, the Voluntary Guidelines on the Responsible Governance of Tenure of Land, Fisheries and Forests in the Context of National Food Security. It can only be the UN that gives a title to something as complicated as that. Um, is, uh, has been a very important effort and there have been discussions within the creation of the Voluntary Guidelines around land tenure uh, involving pastoralists. And whether that's the International Land Coalition, various donors, NGOs, and some and others, you just have to Google land governance and pastoralism to find dozens and dozens of different initiatives. Um, there have been some quite important moves in this regard. A lot of these moves have been in and around so-called community-based land registration. So the idea that to avoid uh, capture of land, uh, by external actors, communities should register their land, i.e. create boundaries uh, that can be visible and negotiated with the state in order to protect their land. And there are millions of different initiatives of different sorts uh, that show that. And the argument is that that improves security, makes pastoral lands more visible, um, and allows people to protect that land and potentially increase productivity and attract investment and so on. Now it's an ongoing debate as to whether that approach which has been widely adopted and advocated is necessarily the most appropriate approach because this is effective a, a move to collective privatization and it's, a, it's embedded in that discourse that we discussed before. How do you do collective, uh, collective approaches to uh, re land registration in hybrid systems? Big question. Um, not obvious in my mind. And I think some of the literature out there, the more nuanced and more particular literature, could challenge some of the assumptions behind some of these initiatives. Which again is why ongoing research into trying to understand the, the real nuanced particular nature of how territories are established, what's the process of, of enclosure, how this is negotiated within hybrid open tenure systems, uh, remains a really important uh, debate. So, uh, my last slide, a picture again of Tibetan rangelands with a huge infrastructural development heading to Europe through the Belt and Road, Road Initiative, or Africa, I don't know, um, uh, dividing rangelands, creating infrastructure, you know, big questions of, of tenure questions going on there. You can see the fences, you can see the road. But in my view, I think a lot of the most recent literature rooted in very detailed empirical studies from very different parts of the world uh, focus, usefully focus in what, on what one might call the politics of land control. Focusing on hybrid institutions, open property systems, complex institutional responses, which in the face of uncertainty, whether that's environmental, social, market, um, haven't really got into the debate on land governance yet.
Perhaps it's too complicated. I don't know. So, despite the land governance debate unfolding in lots of very well-meaning ways and being applied to pastoral areas and pastoral land, land rights, I think the implications of this new thinking, or not so new thinking now, um, has yet to find its way in. Uh, and I think we need to think, particularly when we're thinking about uncertainty, central to the Pastores project, uh, about fluid, not fixed, span, uh, fixed arrangements, um, fuzzy overlapping systems rather than bounded systems, and uncertainty rather than stability assumptions often embedded in conventional governance arrangements. Which, of course, is why I think the work of the Pastores project, thinking of rethinking pastoral land governance under uncertainty may uh, throw up some important policy questions uh, that move us forward for pastoral settings. So I will conclude there.